Hello, I'm honored to be a part of this lecture series and a part of this time together as we talk about Revive Us Again. What a great title. My name is David Duncan, and I preach for the church, the Memorial Church of Christ in Houston, Texas. What an honor it is to be a part of this. And my title, my topic I'm talking about is My Cross I'll Carry, The Burden of Discipleship. But before we even get there, I think about a time years ago before I was married and I decided to bake a cake. Now, I had never baked a cake. I don't know what made me decide I wanted to bake a cake rather than just go buy one, but I did. And I knew it wasn't good enough to just make it completely from scratch. So I went to the store and I bought a mix. And this is the one they used to advertise on the commercials of the soap operas when I was a little boy and my mom would watch them, the, the Betty, Betty Crocker with the yellow cake. And so I got that mix and I looked to see what all it needed. And all I needed to get was like a cup of water and some butter and some eggs and some oil. And so I followed the instructions. I thought this won't be hard at all. And so I did everything it said. I get my mixing bowl and I, I crack my eggs, which I'd never done that before, but I crack them and I put them into the bowl and I pour my water in and I pour the, the oil in and I, I don't even know where I came up with the mixer. I had a roommate at the time. He must have owned it because there's no way I would have had one. So I get it and I mix it all together and I'm going to bake a cake and I'm excited and I'm reading the instructions as I go and I pour it all into the pan and it tells me how long to bake it, put the oven on for 350. I put that into the oven, but somehow it just didn't look right. Something was wrong. I couldn't figure it out, but I went back and I watched television for probably about 10 minutes or so, and I thought, something is wrong with my cake. So I came back and I read the box and I went, okay, I've done everything. I've heated the oven to 350. I, it says mix in, mix in cake mix, water, butter, eggs, in a large bowl, and in beat for vigorously for two minutes. I did all this, but it still, I knew it didn't look right. I turned on the light in the oven and it just didn't look right. It didn't look like the cakes my mother had made. I pull it out and it doesn't look right. So finally, as I'm reading over and over for probably another 10 minutes, I started thinking, this box is really heavy. You know what I did, don't you? I had, I had put in the eggs and the water and the butter and the oil and I'd forgotten the mix, just one thing I had left out. But it was the most important thing, you may say, for the whole thing. I am not going to have a cake, even though I have the eggs and the water and the butter. I'm not going to have a cake if I don't have the mix. So today we're talking about that part of discipleship that may be so difficult, about carrying our cross and what it means to carry our cross. For many of us living in the United States, and even for people who are Christians around the world, sometimes we are religious. Sometimes we go to church, so to speak, and we sit in the pews or on the chairs, and we go to Bible class. We may teach them. We may pre be the preacher even or an elder. But we're not really carrying a cross. We are missing something. And today I want you to hear a little bit about a well-known story in the Bible, a true story, about a man who was missing something in Mark chapter 10 in verses 17 through 25. And the Bible says this, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and he fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Well, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Well, one thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then... Come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is, for the, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to think about this man. Some of us, when we start talking about carrying a cross and start talking about wealth, you may not see how these two things go together. But this is so strong because this rich young ruler was unwilling to carry his cross because of his stuff. He was unwilling to carry his cross because he didn't want to give up his wealth. You know, it's so easy to start talking about wealthy people and those people who won't do what they need to do. You know who, what a wealthy person is? A wealthy person is anyone who has more money than I do. That's a wealthy person. But if you really want to get down to it, I'm wealthy. More, more than likely, you're wealthy. I'm wealthy. You say, well, what do you mean? You're a preacher. Preachers don't make a lot. Well, I do okay, but I'm wealthy. I have a house. I have air conditioning. I have heating. My wife and I each have a car. I mean, we have a bed. We're wealthy. So we fall into this category as well. This isn't about someone else, someplace else. This is about me. And how do I carry my cross even though I have wealth? Maybe not at the same level as the rich young ruler, but I certainly have wealth. Well, this rich young ruler, he claimed to follow all the commands. Isn't that interesting? He said, oh, I've fallen all of those since I was a boy. Really? Really, have you really fallen, uh, followed all of the commands? Did you never backtalk your mother and dad? Really? Were you never a teenager? You know, but he says, no, I haven't done any of those things. Perhaps what he is, is the greatest legalist of all time, saying, well, officially I have checked that box. Officially I have done that. When maybe he has not really kept the commands as far as his heart goes, even though he kept them for some checklist somewhere. But he missed one at least. He's missing one command, the one thing Jesus said to him. He's missing the second greatest command, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you know the greatest command, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And when this man is told, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then come follow me, he says, I can't do it, or I won't do it. So what he's saying is, I don't really love my neighbor that much. But this isn't just a missing of the second greatest commandment. This is also a missing of the greatest commandment. You may know what I'm talking about if you have children or grandchildren, that when you have, say you have two boys, and you love those boys, and they grow up, and one of them says, Mom, I love you, and I plan on being at your house for the 4th of July as long as my brother's not there. You know how that hurts you, don't you? Because you love both of them. What you want is for them to get along and help each other. And here you have the rich young ruler created in the image of God who won't go and help the poor who are also created in the image of the Father. So not only is it missing the second greatest command, he is missing the greatest command by not helping. Well, what stood in the way of this young man? What stood between the man and God? You know what it is, don't you? It's love of money. It's that idea that he loved his money and his stuff more than he loved following Jesus. Now, let me say this again. As we start talking about people who love money and we can show examples of people who buy all kinds of exotic things, I want you to know that I really like money. Sometimes I love money. I'm confessing. Sometimes I love it. Sometimes I want it. And it's not that I have money always, but sometimes I sit around and dream, oh, what could I do if I had a million dollars? What could I do if I had a billion dollars? Can you imagine what kind of house I could buy, what kind of car I could have, what kind of trip I could take? And sometimes I love money. I'm not thinking about how can I help others sometimes. Sometimes I'm, it's all about 
me. And could that be me? Could I be the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus that's not willing to give up everything? Now, if you are watching this and you live in the United States and many other countries of the world, you know, you can come pretty freely. You can come to, to the worship service on Sunday morning. If you have a Sunday night or a small group, you can go to that. You can go to a Wednesday night Bible class. You can do all those things and still not be willing to carry a cross for Jesus. You can still do those things and not really love Jesus or love Jesus enough that you say, I would be willing to give away everything that I have. And so really the, what I'm thinking about this morning or this afternoon is, have I traded the cross for stuff? You know what I'm saying? Is it that I'm not carrying my cross for Jesus, that I'm not willing to go share my faith because of my stuff? I'm not willing to, to talk to people about Christ because of my stuff. I'm not willing because of the things I own or the things I want to own or because of just who I am. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? You know what happens when I think about going over and talking to my neighbor about Christ? You know what happens this morning whenever I thought I need to talk to him about Jesus, whenever I see a man coming to me with his dog and I know him and we chat for a minute and then I wave at him and tell him goodbye? All at once, my stuff gets in the way. Now, it's not physical things, it's my pride. My pride and my shyness, and I'm just so afraid. So I don't tell about Jesus. Sometimes, oh, maybe they won't like me. Maybe they won't make the business deal. Maybe they'll shun me. Maybe friends won't invite me over if I talk about my faith. And so I don't talk about Jesus because of my stuff. I'm afraid I could lose my job, therefore I won't talk about Jesus. What would Jesus say to that? He probably wouldn't want you to lose your job, don't misunderstand me. But he would want you to be clever in finding a way to talk about your faith. Or if we have to lose our job, then he would rather we choose to lose our jobs for him and he made that great promise in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount that he's going to take care of us no matter what. So I have to ask myself some questions. What am I spending on? What am I spending on? When I spend, am I carrying my cross? You know, you, are, you might be saying, well, David, are you saying, I've tuned into this, and now you're saying, I can't have a car. No, of course you can have a car. Buy a car. It may be, be better for you to buy a new car than to buy a jalopy because it's cheaper to buy a new car sometimes than it is to have one fixed all the time, right? I'm saying buy a new car, but use it for the glory of God. Help people with that car. Take groceries to people. Drive to Bible studies. Give rides. Whatever it is. Are you saying I can't buy a house? No, buy a house if you can do that. That's great. But use your house for the glory of God. Use your house for a way to honor him. Many years ago, my parents were won to Jesus by a couple. And this couple living out in northwest Oklahoma at the time, or, or right after they'd converted my parents, they were, this couple was building a new house, and my mom and dad went to their house, and they saw this huge room they were building in their house. They had, they had sufficient funds. And my mother said, I looked at that room, and I thought, this is a waste of money. Why would anybody do anything like this? This is not right. And the man said to my mom, maybe because he knew she was looking around, he said, we are so excited to build this room on because we plan to have the entire congregation into our house often so that we can have fellowship and we can have time together and we can have Bible studies. And I thought of that story years later when I was, they were hosting a dinner when we were missionaries to help us raise money in that same room that they were using that house for the glory of God so that God would be praised and people would come to know Christ on a continent that they had never even traveled to, that they used it for the glory of God. So what am I spending on? What am I saving for? 
You know, some, sometimes we say, well, I've got to save for retirement. Save for retirement. That's not a bad thing. I understand the congregation where I am. Someday they're going to say, David, we need to put you out to pasture. I know that will come one of these days. And so I've got to save. That makes sense. But I need to think about how I save and not save extravagantly so that in some way that the cross somehow gets muddled and the cross isn't what I'm really about because sometimes people are more about their retirement fund, more about their house, more about their car, more about whatever else. So what if God were telling me to do something really outlandish? What if God were telling me to do something that was way beyond anything I'd imagine, even beyond my comfort zone? Now, some of you I know when I said this, you just already went, David, God doesn't talk to us that way. I can tell you right now, God has never talked to me in a whisper, and he has never talked to me with a megaphone. I've never heard a voice. That's not what I'm saying. Some of you are saying, well, if you think God is talking to you, it might have been the burrito from last night. No, I'm talking about when you get it in your head and you just can't let it go. When it's in your head and it's in your heart of what you need to do for the Lord, and you're going, I have got to do that. What if God were calling you to a place like what you can see on the screen right now? A place of poverty to not only help the poor with physical needs, but to help them with the gospel. I don't know even where this place is, but what if God were calling me there? Some of us right away, we're going to say, oh, no, God would not call me there. That's gross. I don't want to be there. I don't even want to look at that picture. I'd never go there. I don't want to go there. So who's your God? You see, it's about being under the lordship of Jesus. How about if he did? This is all theoretical, obviously. But if God called me and I'd say right up, no way, then maybe I'm not carrying my cross. I'm not willing to carry my cross. If God were to call me there to call me to a palace, it's about doing what God says, not about what I want. When I was growing up, I grew up in a small town in the Texas Panhandle, and it was a wonderful place. I had never been anywhere except a seven-state area, the states that were right near the Panhandle, basically. And I went on a mission trip my fr after my freshman year of college, went to Brazil. I was a student at Oklahoma Christian. I went to Brazil on a mission trip. And um, the only reason I went on that trip was because my sister and brother-in-law told me they would give me $500 if I went somewhere. Now, I wasn't going because I was this great young Christian man. I was going for $500. That's what was my motivation to go. And so I went, we went with a group of students, about 16 or 17 students. We go off to Brazil. We had, had uh, two couples that were our sponsors, Howard and Jane Norton and Johnny and Kathy Panisi, some of you may know, and we go off on that trip, and it's wonderful and incredible. And I can remember standing on top of a building in Sao Paulo, Brazil, the tallest building at the time in the city, and looking miles after miles of city and high-rises, and realizing that that city at the time had the same population as the state of Texas. The city, the same population as the state of Texas. And I was overwhelmed. My worldview changed in that moment to see how big it was and to realize the world was so much more than just my little piece of the panhandle. The panhandle's great, but this was overwhelming. And then we went with a few students to the city of Vitoria, Brazil, a city with, with over a, just over a million people at the time. Now it has many more than that, but it was just over a million people. We go up to the tallest place in that city, and Johnny Panisi, one of the sponsors of that trip, says, look out over this city. And he said, this city is almost 450 years old, and churches of Christ have never existed here. Who will come and be a missionary here? I tell you what, that was on my heart so much. And, and, and I became part of a four-family four team, my wife and I and three other families, and we went. 
Let me tell you, I was never great at language. I never planned to go any place outside of the United States. I had no plans for anything like that. But it changed my life because I felt the call that I needed to be the one. I didn't blame other people for, going, for not going because they didn't know about it. I knew about it. And I had to go, and I couldn't think about anything else. I remember telling my mother that I was going to go, and I was, going to, I was making plans already, and I had to figure out how to raise money and do team missions and how we would do all of that. And my mother said, who put this idea in your head? I said, you did. You're the one who, told, who took me to church every week where we had Bible studies and we had them in our home and you said to, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel like the Great Commission said. And she said, well, yeah, but when I was saying all that, I was thinking the Great Commission was like go to, go to Amarillo, not to go to Brazil. You know what I'm talking about? When you have something you see, if it is in your home congregation and you see a ministry that you have to be a part of, and you're saying, I've got to do that. I have got to go help. I've got to go help at that, in that mission work, whether it's domestic or foreign, whatever it is, I have got to help. That message that at least feels like is put there by God himself. And I want you to see in just a moment that I have a wide margin Bible. And the reason I do that is I write down things in my Bible that to help me with my own studies, and I can pick up my Bible and, and teach at just about any time. Plus, I'm writing notes for my daughters whenever I'm old and gone that they can show their children and grandchildren, and maybe they will be one to Jesus through an old Bible that I wrote in. Well, I write those things, but I want you to see on a slide what I wrote next to this passage, not anything theological or doctrine, doctrinal, but I want you to see what I put on this passage of scripture several years ago. What I wrote was, how about if Jesus told me to live in the street or move to Iraq to help refugees? Would I, would I love him that much? I pray yes. You see, this is what it is to carry the cross that we will carry the cross of Jesus, whatever it is. Go wherever he says, eliminate whatever it is that's in the way. Use whatever we have for the glory of God. This is what it's about. There's another story in the Bible in the same chapter. You see this great contrast between two men. We see the, great, the rich young ruler. And quickly we're going to look in Mark 10, verses 46 through 52 at a blind beggar. And the Bible says in verse 46, so they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want for me to do? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. Then they came to Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting on the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do you see how incredible this is? Jesus called this man. Jesus could remove the blind spot for this man's obstacle to see. Jesus could remove it and take it away because it was physical. But only the rich young ruler could remove his own obstacle for sight. Jesus would take away the one from the man who wanted to see but for the man who didn't want to see, only he would be able to take it away. You see, it's the choice that each of us makes. We have to decide. We've been given free will to decide to follow. So I leave you today with this question. What prevents me from carrying 
my cross. What prevents me from doing that? What prevents me from eliminating the things that are in the way? What is it? You know, we live in the last 10, 15, 20 years, really longer than that, but the, those years have been so strong that we have been so shaken. The world has been shaken by so many things. And I think about Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the fear that they've put in us, whether we're, whether we're traveling or we're in the United States, we have this fear of what they could do. They have somehow put fear in us because, because of, the, of the hatred and the murder and the evil that's inside them. But I want you to understand why they have been so effective, so to speak, in, in what they wanted to do. It's because they are sold out. They are sold out. Let me tell you, what they do is awful. But long before there was an Al-Qaeda, long before there was an ISIS, there was Jesus. And what Jesus called his people to do was to be sold out, even more so for, for Jesus' cause than for what Al-Qaeda is sold out for. And what we're to be sold out for are for things for like peace and hope and salvation and love. That's what we were called to and folks, today we sit around and we watch the news and we think what a pitiful world we live in. And we come and we sing our songs and don't even really sometimes know what we're singing about. We mumble through the words. And just maybe, if a group of people who are part of Revive Us Again, if just a group of people could say, I will be sold out to Jesus, I will carry my cross... I won't think of it as a burden, but instead I'll think of it as a privilege. We could change the world in the name of Christ for the glory of Christ. Do you realize what could happen if just one person would be sold out and they could help others to realize that Jesus brings peace and hope and love and salvation. He brings a future And so it has to start with me. And while I know most of you don't know me, what I tell you today is that I vow to the Lord again to be sold out, to carry my cross, to not let earthly things or my pride or my shyness get in the way but to say, Lord, I follow you, I love you, I am committed to you above everything. You are my all. You are it. Carrying my cross will not be a burden, but carrying my cross will be a privilege and an honor to follow the Lord Jesus who took who took whippings for me, who was lied about for me, who went before the Sanhedrin for me, who went before Roman officials for me, who went to the cross for me, and praise God was resurrected from the grave on the third day so that we can serve him forever. I pray that we will carry our crosses.